Hi, Chikondi. Hi, Maitli. I'm so excited to have you here, and I'm, I'm so grateful to you for doing this. Um, I'm very really happy that I'm hosting you on Her Forum, and so welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here, and thank you for remembering me. I was so honored when you texted me. <laughs> of course, of course. And I think that before we go forward, it would be really helpful if I give um, all our viewers a little bit of an introduction of you so they can get to know you a little bit about your journey right now and have some more context. Uh, and so this is for everyone listening. Chikondi holds the LLB from the University of Malawi and an LLM from Harvard Law School, which she attended as the Fulbright Scholar, which almost all of us know is amongst the most prestigious scholarships in the world. She's the youngest magistrate in the history of Malawi. In addition, she's also the legal research lead at the Gender and Justice Unit, works in the advancement of rights of incarcerated persons with the Center of Human Rights, and focuses on the access of justice for women with the Women Judges Association of Malawi. Wow, that's a lot. But in addition, I just want to say I've had the pleasure of being classmates with Chikondi and can confidently say that she is amongst the most accomplished, yet humble, and elegant people I have ever met. Chikondi, you're very inspiring, and I just want to say once again that I'm very excited that you're here with us and that I can share your journey on this platform. So welcome. Thank you, my Tilly. Um, just, I'm, like I said, I'm very honored, very excited that you have had me on. And I've looked at all your social media pages and I think it's such an exciting, exciting forum that you've come up with. There's very few spaces for lawyers to interact, especially women lawyers and across continents, across countries. And it's a very, very important forum for engagement. So thank you very much for having me. I'm so glad. Uh, okay, so I have some questions for you, so I'm just gonna get right into them. Um, you are the youngest magistrate in the history of Malawi, and that's an incredible honor. And to me, not surprising having gotten to know you. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, you know, very often people, and I'm talking more about like senior lawyers in that sense, in my experience, can tend to equate youth with a lack of experience and, you know, sort of attach less credibility to even highly achieved young lawyers. Did, did you ever face this um, when you were sitting on the bench and did it ever daunt you? And if yes, then how did you sort of overcome it? Yeah, I think, I think you're very right. Um, and especially in a profession like ours where everything, especially career progression is based on your years of experience. It can be quite daunting to be young, not only to be young, but also to have less years of experience. So I'm still relatively young now, but have a bit more experience under my belt. And I guess that credibility has built, but some of the things that have kept me going are, I think there are three things that I can point out. The first is to be very tenacious in your work. And that doesn't mean sleeping at 2 a.m. and not, not, not getting enough rest, not, you know, like being too work focused, but it's, putting out good quality work that people can always trust. And, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that it is still true that women have to put in twice as much work for half the recognition. Um, but that's the reality that we live in. And sometimes you have to, that's how you build your profile. You build your profile by ensuring that you deliver good quality work and you deliver that good quality work on time. And I think the second thing is not to, not to be intimidated. Don't be intimidated. Um, I finished law school in 2013. Some of my bosses had finished 10, 20 odd years before me and laws had been changing. You know, the world was changing as well. And that's kind of an advantage that you have as a young person is that you know exactly what's going on on the ground. And you've seen the progression from the time that your senior, your seniors completed their legal studies to, to the time that you completed your legal studies. And you, you've kind of got the benefit of hindsight um, that they don't have because, and, and this happens to me sometimes. It's like, oh, this is not what I learned in law school, but then the law has changed since I finished and you need to have a mindset shift. And this also goes for the laws themselves as they're being enacted. So I'll give an example of Malawi. Um, from the time that I started law school and the time that I finished, there were a lot of gender-based laws or like gender-related laws that were enacted that were not in place at the time when I was starting law school and especially not so 
when my senior colleagues were, were in law school or have been practicing. So there was that shift of making laws more women oriented, making them more beneficial to women and trying to fight for a more just and equal world for women. And you have that advantage kind of um, looking back and seeing the progression of that. And now you are placed in a situation where you've seen where the law has come from and where it is now and the importance of it being in that place. Um, so apart from not being intimidated, I think the third thing is also, you know, talk truth to power. Um, when you're in a room, don't shrink yourself. Don't shrink yourself. You think just as well, you know? The fact that you don't have the same amount of experience as maybe half of the people in the room, the fact that you're female and you might be one of few female people in the room does not mean that what your opinion is, is not valid. You know, your opinion is valid. Your research is beneficial. Your knowledge is important and you can always contribute something to the room. So being young, those are the three things I can say. The first is, um, you know, challenge you know i think that that's the that's the greatest thing is to challenge is to challenge that challenge those perceptions of you challenge the stereotypes about young people being lazy millennials are always on their phones and they're all about social media etc be the one that stands out put out good quality work don't be intimidated speak your truth i think that's how i'd answer that question Wow, that, that was very helpful. I especially like the word you use, which is tenacious. I think that sort of encapsulates everything just perfectly. And I think I, I agree because I feel that um, at a lot, at lots of times, I just feel that I want to question something. And, I, and I'm sure a lot of people watching are going to feel similarly. But because, you know, I just don't have the confidence to go through with it because I'm starting to self-doubt. I, I will not say it. And then five minutes later, someone else has said that point, And I'm like, I could have had that point. Um, so I, I think that's, that's very useful. And I, and I hope that I feel that I have sort of in that sense improved and tried to like build that self-belief. And I'm, I'm sure like more people listening to this will also do the same. So thank you. That was, that was very, very helpful. And sort of to just go piggyback from there, I wanted to ask you that you decided to pursue a judicial career. I wanted to know a little bit more about your decision-making process. Because I feel increasingly the trend, at least for me, um, and I, I think it's similar for you and everywhere we see, is that a lot of people tend to get into private practice. So what sort of drove your decision? Um, well, my, my, my decision to join the judiciary was quite a personal one. Um, we had had a horrible encounter at my home with my parents where we had a break-in and so on and so forth. So initially, I also wanted to join private practice and I wanted to be the woman with the corner office and the nice suit and all that jazz. And eventually I was like, you know, I think there's more to be done in the justice system. And it, it's one thing to complain about corrupt and, you know, inefficient public services and be outside of that public sector. I wanted to be a part of a, an efficient public sector that actually delivers the services that it says it will deliver. So if our goal is to provide good judicial service, then I want to be a part of that. Um, so eventually the chips fell where they could and it, it's been quite, it's been a very rewarding career. But um, just looking back, I think the public service needs the the stereotype, I don't know if it's the same with you in India, but the stereotype is usually that it's the lazy people that go into public service. Um, and that's not true because I think I work hard, you know, and we, we need to change that and say that there are actually people who are willing to serve and actually serve um, the public. And by going into public service and ensuring that there's efficient, effective justice delivery, that will be corruption free. That will turn those stereotypes on their head, that would challenge those biases, I think is important. We can't do that if we shun the services that we complain about. We need to join public service in order for us to be the change, you know, as cliche as that sounds, but it, it's very difficult to change a system from outside. There's, there's importance in outside pressure 
in reforming a system, but there's also a need for good um, service providers who are committed to their work and will move the service forward and provide the good quality service that everyone is looking for. So I think it, it's good not to shy away from sectors or services that you think are challenging, but to challenge yourself and work towards being that one shining light or one of a few shining lights um, to make public service delivery really, really good. Yeah. Wow, that, that was very inspiring. I think the quote that I thought of instantly was be the change you want to see. Um, so thank you, that, that was super inspiring. And I, and I think that it, it is similar in India. I think there is, there is a perception that government officials are not working as much. There is a perception that it's sort of like, um, you know, it's sort of like the back end. And, and it's obviously so false because, you know, it's the system, it is the justice system and the judiciary is the system that's driving law uh, in our countries. Um, yeah. And I did think though that, I don't know if you want to comment on this at all, but I did think that the perception in the United States was very different. Like when I, when we were at Harvard, I remember seeing the, the, you know, the sort of honor in being a judge and, you know, how much people look up to it, including even clerkships, right? Like we were always like, it always seemed to be that, you know, the brightest kids become Supreme Court clerks and, you know, it, it takes a lot to get there. And I don't think it's the same in India. Um, so I think the perceptions are very different. Do you want to say something about this maybe? Um, I agree. I actually agree. I was very shocked about how many people were striving for clerkships. Um, and it's, oh, you're actually working this hard to join the public service, um, which, which is very different from what we, from Malawi and maybe India as well, where everyone wants to graduate and find a nice private sector job, a private practice job. Um, but perceptions are different. And, and more so, I will, I will give an anecdote from Malawi. Um, we recently had our constitutional, um, the high court sitting as a constitutional court overturn um, our elections and order a rerun of the elections. And now there's a lot more trust in the public service, you know? So I think it's, it's what we were talking about, having a few bold, good individuals who will make those strong decisions and will restore that trust in the public service. So perceptions are very different, I think, across continents. Um, there's also other countries that don't believe that they can get justice from the judicial system. And everyone who works there is just seen as a conduit for further injustice. So it's, it's very different across countries. And it's very, um, it's, it, it's very illuminating, like insightful when you talk to people from different regions and different countries as to what their perception of like the judicial service is or what the judicial sector should be. So that, that's actually very true. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and at the end of the day, you know, they say that justice is not only, should not only be done, but also be seen to be done. And so I think that sort of rings a bell with everything that you've spoken about. And now that we are sort of, you know, in the middle of talking about the justice system, I, I wanted to ask this and um, sort of get your thoughts on this. The representation of women in judiciary has been quite poor everywhere, um, you know, everywhere in the world. I mean, even when you look at the highest courts of, say, you know, the Western countries, which it, traditionally people, people from other countries feel are more evolved or more equal. So even when you look at the Supreme Court of the US or whether you look at the Queen's Bench in England, I don't think the representation matches the representation of population. So I want to ask you, why do you think this is the case? Like, have you ever faced any pushback because of gender? And what do you think can bring a change to the lack of women in the judiciary? That, that's an interesting one. It reminds me of a quote from Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who said when she was asked how many at what point do you think there'll be equal representation? And she said when there were nine, and that's the total number. <laughs> that's the total number of Supreme Court justices. Um, and, and I mean, I echo that completely. I think if we would have a judicial system full of 
women judges, it would be amazing. And I would take that as fair representation because in Malawi, for example, we make up over 50% of the population, but our Supreme Court out of nine only had one woman and she's recently retired. So that means we have eight male Supreme Court justices. Um, and, and I think an interesting anecdote from Malawi in terms of the numbers is that the higher up in the judicial system you go, the fewer women there are. So at the magistracy level, we have a lot of women, um, maybe even more women than men. But when you now go to the Supreme Court, out of 20 something judges, less than 10 are women. When you go to the Supreme Court, it's what I just said, only one was a woman. So it, it's not just about having representation, but also having representation of women in the highest offices. Um, so, that's that's one and on another level historically i think um education the the structure of our societies has been one that has not valued education of female children and most times where you're a woman you've got the added burden of being the carer you've got the added responsibility of being a mother um being a sister wife etc and that kind of pushes people away from professions where you have to put in a lot of work or a lot of time and then what happens is you join corporate maybe where you do board minutes every once in a while you'll be company secretary or you'll be like the lead legal person and it's not too much of a time commitment so I think that's another thing. Um, but our laws have progressed in such a way that we now have paid maternity leave. There's greater opportunities for women's advancement that we, we need to reach out and take. Um, there's a law firm um, that I know of that I think the, the partner is very reluctant to hire women, especially women of childbearing age, because he says, once she gives birth, she's going to leave for three months and I won't have my lawyer here with me. So it's perceptions like that that we need to change. That that three months is, you know, you're entitled to it. And if you choose to have a family, then you should be able to do that without that compromising your, your career progression. Um, so th there's that, there's just the fact that women are the ones that bear children and you know and i use women loosely or take care of children should not be something that hampers um career progression so i think those are the the two things that i would say i think historically we are coming from a time where less fewer women were educated and were willing to take up these positions but as the laws and um conditions of service have progressed it's made it a lot easier or at least a, little more, a lot more bearable for women to rise um, in their careers and to take up the more challenging positions so yeah yeah i think i think that's what yeah that, that's been very interesting because actually recently not not too long ago i was talking to my best friend and she had gone in for a job interview and believe it or not um the the guy interviewing her the man interviewing her asked her, so uh, are you dating someone? And so, you know, for a second, she was just taken aback. Sort of in that situation when like, you're in an interview and you don't want to be rude, but also that's territorially personal, you know, that is, that is not something you want to discuss with someone in an interview. And so then she sort of asked him after the interview ended, you know, very hesitantly, but she wanted to push back and asked him that, you know, why was that question asked? And she, he says that, because I want to know whether you're going to have children, whether I'm going to lose you soon. And so I think that all of that that you just said sort of like culminates into a story like that. And, and then you realize how it's a very real issue. And in that sense, also how paternity leave is good because it sort of makes childbearing a two-person role rather than what traditionally societally makes seem like one person, right? And I think yes. uh, just speaking of RBG, there, there's another quote where she's also said that, that when society realizes that the, the responsibility to bring up a child is a two-person job or is for both man and woman. That's when we'll progress. Um, so 
I think I, I agree with all of this that you've said. And, and sort of again, like we were talking a little bit about education. You spoke about it in your answer. I wanted to ask you that, you know, you've done a lot of tremendous work in the field of gender-based law, sensitivity and training and education for the judicial sector. And I think that really there has been a thought process and, you know, there are NGOs that are working on this. There's Think Education and all of these things that are working on the fact that gender stereotypes or gender sensitivity and equality can be cultivated in children right from the young age. And that is sort of the solution to problems because right from that age when we were, when we were five years old, um, you know, if we can change the mindset of a child that the, these genders are equal and there's no role for each, there's no gender role for each. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Do you think that is something you uh, agree with in the sense, do you think it's a good solution? Or and, and also one more thing sort of to follow up is that, do you feel that there is a change that you see? I, I think so. I think so. Um, the... The, the initiative that you speak of, uh, we've been doing as the Women Judges Association of Malawi. So our our core our core issue is bringing the courts to the people, and that includes understanding court processes, which inevitably means understanding the laws that affect women. Um, and some of our outreach has just been literally to schools, and you know, going there in your legal attire and showing girls that there are women lawyers because most times they're not the ones that you see if you pick up a newspaper you'll see a man dressed in the you know legal garb and you're like oh okay so that's what a lawyer should look like you know and if you ask girls in primary schools like what do you want to be when you grow up they'll say a nurse because they've seen nurses they've seen female nurses They'll say, I want to be a teacher because their teachers are female, um, but never I want to be a doctor. And maybe sometimes it's like, you know, when you're young, you, you see everyone wearing a white coat and you're like, oh, that's the nurse. <laughs> um, but it's also just exposing, um, exposing children to the, the diversity in professions and also showing that within a profession, there is diversity within the profession itself. So it's not just lawyers that go and argue like from the bar. There's also the lawyers that sit at the bench as judicial officers. And that's kind of been um, interesting. And I think another change that I have seen when you speak of whether it's having an effect or not is with these talks and um, some of our court cases have been publicized. So the constitutional court I was telling you about had one woman on the panel and, you know, every time the lawyers would address, because it was a five, five judge panel and there was one woman and every time they would address the female judge, they would say, my lady. Now, every time, and it was broadcast on national radio every single day of the proceedings. And every day, if you walk literally on the street and someone asks you, what do you do? They say, and you say, oh, I work for the judiciary. They're like, oh, my lady. You know, and, and that's the power of, that's just the power of legal education. And sometimes it's not like sitting in a classroom and educating people. It's just exposing them to the court process as well. Like you can have a woman in a position of power who makes decisions. Um, and, and I think that has been amazing. I agree that, you know, nurture and culture is, through education, formal and informal, is something that needs to expose and and i really believe in if you can see a person who looks like you doing something that you want to do it makes it that much more attainable so one thing when i was finishing my high school i think was my dad who luckily had access to these channels he took me around when i was considering what i wanted to study he introduced me to some female lawyers so he introduced me to a lawyer who ran her own private practice, introduced me to one who was a company secretary, like the head of legal, and another one who worked for the government, I think the Ministry of Justice or something. And 
it was amazing. And I was like, oh, okay, so this is attainable. And one of them was like, oh, you know, the, the one thing I wanted to do when I studied law was I wanted to sit at a corner office and have a big chair that swings around. And she was like, and here I am, I've got my big office and big desk with my chair that moves around. And it's like, you see, sometimes it's, it's something that's simple. There are girls who, when we go for our outreach, they're like, oh, I really like your suits. Right. I really like the way you're dressed in your suit and your heels and I want to be like you. So I think it's really important to show girls that there are people in those positions. And the more of us they are, the more of us that are on, for example, constitutional court panels, the more of us that are being seen in human rights or like um, NGO sector speaking out on issues that are important. Um, the more that we will inspire young children. So no, no form of education is too small. It's the exposure to people who look like you that um, kind of inspires you to, to join a certain field. And, and like I said, sometimes it's really small things. It's really small things. It could be just wearing the crisp white shirt is what makes people really like the profession and you could be that person who exposes that to a, a, a child and you form that mentality in them growing up so yeah i agree i think i think um education is important and that exposure is very important thank you that that was like that was so nice to hear because i think especially what you said about someone you met on the road then calling you my lady because of the uh, exposure to the t television proceedings of the Supreme Court or the Constitutional Court. Um, yeah, and I think it's very interesting. That's also, I think the power of media, if we actually use it well, the, there's so much power, um, especially getting it to like all levels of society and all types of people and, and in every way. So that was very helpful. Um, I mean, again, sort of sticking again to the judiciary and just, just sticking to your work in that sense. Uh, I wanted to talk about, about something very interesting, um, which I actually found out, uh, I think maybe halfway through Harvard. And so now that I have finally got you here, I think this is a good time to talk to you about this. Um, in March 2015, when you were about 23 years old, you heard a case where two men had been accused of vandalism and violence at a soccer match. And um, you delivered a ruling on your handling of bail in that case which made national headlines and um, it, it very quickly escalated into the news and you, the, basically the way you handled it from whatever I have understood is that you asked them to report to a nearby police station every single time there was going to be a soccer match. And um, I of course found that very interesting as well. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that ruling on the soccer incident and sort of understand your thought process and theory of justice underlying that ruling. Yeah. Um, well, that that's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> um, at at the time, I think well, well, to date, actually, we are really fighting prison overcrowding in Malawi. So when a person is arrested, um, at, they'll be at the police station, and then when they come to the court and take plea or not, then you decide whether to give them bail or not. So with bail they can go home, but you need to attach some kind of conditions to ensure that they're still attending court. And I thought, you know, one, it was very heated at the time where everyone was mad, you know, they were like, it was like a derby and these like rival soccer teams, et cetera. And if you release them into the community, then it would be easy to pin other vandalism, like further vandalism on those two people who had already been arrested. So I thought, you know, this would be a good solution to ensure that they are not going to soccer matches. And, and one of them actually was like a very staunch football fan. And he was really, really religious in reporting. I mean, both of them reported eventually and one was convicted, the other one was acquitted. Um, but the, the very staunch fan was very religious in his reporting. And he was like, you know what, I really like soccer and I will fulfill these conditions of bail so that I can go to a soccer match freely once again. So I, I think the underlying issue for me was to keep people out of the prisons, one, because it was vandalism at a match, at a soccer match, where it was probably a lot of people involved and maybe those were just the two that got caught. Um, and I think having a form 
or thinking about bail conditions in a way that will reform in helping a person understand the gravity of their actions or their or the actions that they were accused of doing um, by showing them like what the repercussions could be because it could have been a ban on football matches altogether you know but by showing them that okay every time you need to report to the police station then they know that okay i'm staying out of trouble and i'm not going to be no further crimes are going to be pinned on me but i'm also showing penance for what i did um so i think it was it was quite a i think it was it was interesting for that reason <laughs> for that reason and I wasn't, uh, at the time I made the decision, I wasn't, I, I didn't know that it would have all this. Um, it was just surprising one day, like two days later, I was driving home and I was listening to the radio and there was a commentary on like a soccer, one of these soccer shows. And they're like, oh, what was this magistrate thinking? And they were like laughing, they're like, oh no. And they weighed the pros and cons. But I think that was what was underlying it. I, I just thought we need a bit more creativity with our bail conditions to ensure that due process is followed, but also not to use it as punishment per se. Um, don't use it as, uh, yeah. Ensure that due process is followed. Don't use it as punishment, but also to ensure that like you said, justice shouldn't only be done, it should be seen to be done. So the community around as well, every time if there's a soccer match, he knows it's on at two o'clock, 1.30, he's on his way to the police station and the community can see that, okay, this is not the person who we should be, or if, if there would be any further acts pinned on him, then he's not the person because he's actually faithfully reporting to the police station. So I think it was just my attempt at giving like holistic justice kind of, that benefits the society, that ensures due process is followed, and also um, looks at the particular circumstances of, of the purported offender. Yeah. Wow, that is uh, very powerful. And yeah, I mean, while you were, you know, talking, I was in my head just thinking holistic justice, and, and then you used the exact word. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, that, that is amazing and that's it's so powerful. You were 23 at that time. I still can't get over that fact. <laughs> I was. Um, I joined the court when I was 22 and uh, it was crazy. I, I looked a lot younger. <laughs> Obviously, I'd be sitting there at the bench and people would come in and say, but where's the magistrate? <laughs> And it's, you know, just those little things. And I have I actually had quite a few people come back after handling their court cases and they would say, you know, we had very little faith in your ability to handle the case, but you, you've handled it very well and we appreciate your insights. We appreciate your, you know, just the time you've taken and the care you've shown. So it, it, it was actually very rewarding. It was rewarding. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. And I think that sort of makes me think of something a professor had once told me when I asked her. She, she's one of the, the biggest um, practitioners in international arbitration. And I remember asking her, you know, why is there such few women doing um, high level dispute resolution or doing international disputes? And I, I wondered if it ever daunted her. And so she said that, and, and I also was struggling with the fact that, you know, how do you contribute to women empowerment? from like a private practice room, you know, how do you sort of realign both the goals to get one common goal? And I remember what she told me was that if you do a damn good job at what you're doing, the next time someone walks into a room with a young woman lawyer, they'll never doubt the young woman lawyer because of the experience they've had with you. And I think she was just like, individually, we can break stereotypes and, you know, just a little, little um, blows at the glass ceiling will will get it down. And I think that sort of stayed in mind. And that sort of, I think also what, the, what you were talking about made me think of that as well. And I think my next question, which is my last, before we do a more fun rapid fire round in that sense. And this question I honestly have always had for judges. And now that you're here and I have like a golden chance of being one-on-one -on -one with you in this sort of casual fireside chat, I want to ask you, um, I often think that I personally, and I'm pretty sure everyone, because I think as human beings, we have this tendency, is that I tend to overthink my work multiple times and, you know, reflect in retrospect, which is always a very dangerous path to sort of go down. 
And I'm guessing that in your line of work, that probably comes up a lot more frequently, you know, given the fact that you are a representation of the country's public service, you are the representation of the country's judiciary. And of course, the pressure is much greater because you are the decider in that sense. Do you have a phase uh, where, you know, you keep revisiting um, the stuff that you've done, the decisions that you've made? And how do you sort of, has it become better since the day you started? And how do you sort of get past it? Hmm. That's a really great question. Um, I think when I, when I started, I... I, I, as a young magistrate, I remember I combed through every single law book and every single book on procedure to make sure I was not getting it wrong. And um, another one was also asking questions and asking judges, those ahead of me, asking fellow magistrates who had a bit more experience than me. And I think the, the bottom line in ensuring that or at least having the conviction in yourself that you've made a good decision is knowing that you followed the law and you followed the procedure, you followed the process, you've analyzed the evidence. And, and sometimes you can shoot yourself in the foot, like you said. Um, it might take you longer to write a judgment. It might mean you write a 30 page judgment instead of a 10 page judgment, <laughs> just because you want to make sure you left no stone unturned, right? And, and sometimes people will come, I remember being younger, where they would say, oh, your judgments are too long. You, you have to stop this at some point because like pressure of work is going to get higher. And I'm like, you know, I want when people are walking away from my court, um, whether the decision is in their favor or not, they should know that I took my time, that I took my time that I come through the evidence and that I gave them some sense of fairness, that they should come away feeling some sense of justice, right? Um, so I think, and so that's one, one, one aspect. And in terms of reflection, when I look at my judgments from my first year of work to date, <laughs> they have really changed a lot <laughs> and <laughs> they have really changed and sometimes i look back and i'm like wow <laughs> this is growth or change you know so i think there's there's that constant reflection that you're that you're going through and it's also from exposure to other people's judgments um in the judicial sector we tend to work in silos because my court is my court and apart from maybe the decisions from the higher court that bind you it's it's very rare for you to read like judgments from your peers etc i think it's important too um it's also important to engage in discussions um recently our law society has well i think from a few years ago our, uh, the malawi law society has been having like continuing practical development um sessions and all sorts of just like lawyer engagements and i think it's important for you to attend those just to see what's going not not as a way of influencing your decisions but as a way of at least being in tune with the law um the processes and like different interpretations because sometimes you get stuck in your own little world so it's good to continuously build on your knowledge build on your knowledge base um expose yourself to different ideas and really challenge yourself with those ideas and say, you know, um, I think another thing is also to know your biases. Um, it's very important to know your biases and how that comes into your decision making process. So I might be a hypersensitive woman, right? And as long as there's a woman, I might not look at an issue objectively just because I'm like, oh no, historically women are looked down upon in such and such and such. And my decisions will always be in that, in that, on in that line right um or i come from a middle class background and might not appreciate um some of the issues that people from different backgrounds than me face so i think it's important to constantly challenge yourself um to learn more about the world around you the people that you are serving and not in their expectations of justice to preempt your decisions but in what at the end of the day, when we say we are serving the public, 
that's what it is. And, and, and justice is about, you know, ensuring the best solution for um, the people before you and the society at large. So, yeah, I think reflection is very, very important. It's just important not to get stuck in your head. And you can only do that if you know that every single decision that you made or that you make, you've, you did your research had enough knowledge and you you feel in your heart that you made the right decision. I think it's it's harder for you to live with decisions that you've made if you know that inherently somewhere something went wrong or you didn't give it enough time or you didn't, you know, you might have missed something and you didn't bother going back to it. So I think it's important. It, it still goes back to the quality of work that you put out in making sure that your quality is high. And And I guess with time, when you set your bar so high, if you constantly doing research, et cetera, it becomes easier. Like, you know how your first day studying is so hard and you're like, oh my gosh, I studied for two hours. Wow. And then eventually you build on that and then it becomes easier. It's, it's not easier, but it becomes more manageable. And then your work is consistently set to a higher standard. So I think, I think it's important to continue the self-reflection and just to maintain that quality of work and improve it where you can. Thank you. That, that was super insightful. I, I think I, I agree that, you know, once you put in your best, then you can rest easier in that sense. And I think that's, that's also what you were speaking to. Um, and uh, so thank you for that. That was super useful. And I think that a lot of people watching and I think a lot of people in general who face this can take some inspiration from that. Um, and now sort of getting to a more fun question now. And I, I've had very serious questions for you, but now to sort of have a little bit more fun. Um, I have like four questions, which are just short questions in that sense. Um, and so it sort of becomes like a rapid fire. Uh, and so okay. I'm going with the first one. Um, All right. Okay, so the first one is two women who inspire you the most. Hmm. Malawi's first chief, first female chief justice, Anastasia Msosa. She's the first and only, actually. And uh, I want to say my mother, but that would be unfair. <laughs> um, so I will say Wangari Matai. She's, uh, she was a Kenyan environmental activist and one of the first or few African women to win a Nobel Prize. So those are the two women. I, I love that you mentioned your mother. I think that that's very valid. Uh, and also, I'm sure that um, she wasn't the last Chief Justice of Malawi who was a woman. I'm, I'm kind of rooting for this happening. <laughs> and then we're going to do one more conversation after that. Um, but OK, so the second question is, favorite activity to unwind? Favorite activity. Um, I run a lot. I think you know this. <laughs> I run a lot. I've recently started doing long distance, have been slacking because of COVID, but I run. I, I like to run. <laughs> okay, to everyone else who's listening to this, who when she means slacking, she means running just 10 kilometers. That's it. <laughs> No, I know this. I think at some point you did definitely bond over this. And um, I used to always see you even in the frigidness of the Boston winters, just sitting on a bench in your running shoes after you finished your run. And I'm like, this girl is amazing. She runs even on the coldest of days. Uh, okay, my next question is your all-time favorite legal movie. Sorry. All-time favorite legal movie. I don't know if this counts as a legal movie. No, I don't remember the name. Um, 12 Angry Men. Yeah, that's a favorite. That's a great pick. Again, this is my last question to you. Um, and also personally favorite one that I want to ask you. Um, your all-time favorite HLS um, non-classroom memory. Oh. <sighs> I think it's standing in front of the library at the front desk, procrastinating for, more, for one hour, talking about nothing and just enjoying people's company. I think those were my favorite times. 
That's great. I think uh, I I can't even remember the number of times that all of us used to do that. We used to dress tight. Yeah. Yes. And I'm like, okay, I'm literally spent like an hour and a half, which I should have been studying. But yeah, that's a great. Movie. Um, I think in general, I feel like uh, the library at Harvard was just definitely my favorite part of the law school experience. I agree. I agree, and I think I think it brought a lot of us together. I think, um, well, those that went to the library a lot, like you'd meet so often that you'd end up like, oh, you know, there's food in WCC what, or oh, are you doing this 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 weekend? Like, I think that's where our relationships really grew. Um, had it had it been otherwise, it, it would have been a bit difficult. Um, it was a bit more like very generic and very authentic way to build relationships just by going through every day together so we built some really really good lasting friendships during that time <laughs> absolutely and so sort of that br- brings me to uh, an end to all the long list of questions that i had which you answered so patiently and so candidly and for that i can't thank you enough because i am personally so inspired by you and i know that a lot of people who are going to be listening to this uh, which is in general going to be women um are going to feel very inspired and are going to be able to use some tips and relate to a lot of the stuff that you've said so thank you for being so candid and for being so kind with your time um and thank you for doing this i'm so excited that i got to host you on her call Yes, thank you so much. I was so excited when you reached out. I keep saying this. And um I'm looking forward to inspiring current next generation um lawyers and very excited that they will have a space where they can talk to people in the field, know what the challenges are and know how to break down those barriers. I think it's a very important conversation to have. So thank you to you and thank you to her forum for having me on it's been such an honor and such a pleasure and you've been a wonderful host thank you so much thank you